Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good morning, good evening, good day, wherever you are. Um, thanks for joining us. I'm Wei Ping Wu, the director of the PhD program in urban planning here at GSAP, Columbia University. Joining me today also are my colleagues, our professors Hiba Boakar and Tom Slater, and I will let them introduce themselves a um, little bit uh, in about 10 or 15 minutes, um, much more fully about their research and their work and their um, ways of working with doctoral students. At first, I think what will be helpful for all of you uh, is for me to introduce the program uh, very quickly, outline some key features, and then uh, hopefully that won't take more than 10 minutes, and then we'll open up for our faculty uh, to introduce, I'll have some conversations with them, and then of course we'll open up for questions. And if you have questions while I am uh, presenting, feel free to jot them down in the chat box. So let's get started here. Uh, so welcome again. So I don't have to convince you about PhD program or urban planning. So you all have thought quite a bit about that, but why Columbia, right? Why Columbia PhD? And uh, the first thing really I wanna say is our uh, required curriculum is fairly moderate in size. So it offers a lot of flexibility. We very much encourage students to explore intellectually within GSAP uh, in terms of curriculum choices, but also across Columbia. And in fact, all of our students take courses in arts and sciences, SIPA, engineering, Earth Institute, or other schools. So the curriculum is very flexible and dynamic. And as is with the history of the Columbia Urban Planning Program, both in the master's and PhD levels, uh, we have long had a tradition of commitment to social, racial, and now climate justice in built environment. And this is uh, very much um, a core element of the PhD program. And you will also see that in the work of our faculty across the board. And uh, also similarly to our master's program, uh, the PhD program is very much globally anchored in the sense that we don't try to cover all of the world regions. Instead, we really wanna to bring together into a conversation of issues in global North and global South in a broadly comparative framework but really more to encourage our students to have that critical analytical ability to understand how local conditions and context frame and situate our work. Um, last but not least, uh, our program has uh, been building an increasing strong uh, focus on urban science and analytics, especially at the master's level. Uh, of course, PhD, we gradually are building that with uh, a new faculty joining us this year. And beyond curriculum, we also really try to hope to help our students to think about primarily a career in the academia, but also beyond academia. So we have professional development activities that connect our students with um, folks or graduates who have gone on beyond academia. And just really quickly, the history is long and, um, and sort of storied, and we'd be happy to answer more questions down the road. Our faculty, especially the full-time faculty, now we have seven in uh, total number. It's a moderate size, although for doctoral program, that's actually fairly decent size among all of the urban planning programs in North America that have PhD programs. And as you can see, our uh, full-time faculty have been very productive and on the um, front lines of knowledge accumulation. And we uh, research issues across a number of areas in planning, and uh, also uh, in terms of a global scope that we also are quite broad. And so we have five uh, major um, faculty and full-time faculty members uh, anchoring the PhD program. 
Uh, I've had students asking me whether uh, you must work with one of these five students as your doctoral thesis, uh, dissertation advisor down the road. The answer is primarily yes, but we do have a few additional uh, doctoral advisors who are part of GSAP, and then you can check that out on the website. Uh, so we'll introduce the faculty a little bit later. So the doctoral coursework, as I mentioned, is quite uh, moderate in size and really tries to anchor the theoretical and methodological core of uh, doctoral studies. So as you can see, we have six courses as required, um, advanced uh, planning history, advanced planning theory, and then uh, three colloquium, colloquial, uh, one on more quantitative methods uh, together with the research design, another more on qualitative research methods, and then a critical urban theory colloquium that is being taught uh, currently actually by Professor Slater. And so these courses, because of our small cohort each year of new PhD students, these courses are actually taught every other year, each one of them. So when you enter, some of you, you will actually be taking the class either with a cohort of three second year doctoral students or in your second year with a cohort of three first year students. So that naturally forms a very nice peer group. Of course, the doctoral students also do much more beyond uh, just interaction within classes. And then beyond those six required courses, also the advanced research independent study course, the six is really a course that all students undertake in their fourth semester or the spring semester, spring semester of their second year for you through which they prepare for their comprehensive exam. So then we require you to take two additional research methods class. And so a lot of students go take uh, you know, ethnography if they are more qualitatively inclined. And then number of students take our GIS class in the master's curriculum, which is really quite high octum in the sense that covers a lot of critical thinking in spatial analysis. And then we also have students so go take econometrics if they are uh, much more quantitative uh, inclined. Then you are also required to take um, at least three courses uh, electives that you consider very central to the directions of research that you want to pursue for your uh, dissertation. And we call it specialty, right? And then we, so I mentioned the GIS class. We also highly recommend doctoral students, especially those without much planning background uh, to take our master's required course, History and Theory of Planning taught by a Professor Boakar here. So you, if you have any questions, feel free to ask uh, in a little bit. So as I mentioned that our students go across the campus, to take courses and seek connections with faculty. And these are just some examples of departments and schools um, with which our students have built um, uh, connections as well as um, invitation for some faculty member to sit on their um, exam, comprehensive exam or doctoral dissertation committees. So really um, in a sense, uh, the world is the limit uh, or the sky, you know, there's just a lot going on intellectually and uh, uh, academically across campus. So I know a lot of you are um, concerned about how you support yourself, um, while in the doctoral program. And you might have heard that the Columbia student workers uh, unionized uh, last year. And with that, um, doctoral student support has been uniformly um, sort of endorsed. And so anybody who's admitted, so we admit three new students each year for the doctoral program. Anybody who's admitted will have full scholarship for at least five years. Now, I believe the amount now uh, comes to somewhat mid 30,000, close to 40. So by next year, it'll be much closer to 40,000. That is, um, that's considered stipend. It is on top of the tuition that is fully covered by the university. And then there is a summer stipend, something in the amount of 
uh, six or seven thousand dollars in addition to the uh, regular scholarship. So students entering the planning PhD program between their second and fourth years, and that means for three years, they'll be appointed either either as a research or a teaching fellow with some responsibilities. And so uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask later. And then there are other kinds of um, both professional development and research types of opportunities and support throughout the program, the school, as well as across campus. So I just outlining a few here. So last but not least is your application, right? And you are all um, very committed um, prospective students and going to a PG program requires a lot of commitment, both in terms of energy, time, everything else. So I wanna say, I wanna provide as much uh, transparency as possible so that you have more understanding of the process. Deadline is December 15th, and this is actually quite consistent with many um, arts and science programs and social sciences across campus. And um, we very much are looking for evidence, especially through your personal statement, as well as, of course, the recommendation letters, um, the uh, transcript of your bachelor and master's program. We require a master's degree prior to entry into the PhD program. And if you have a writing sample, of course. So your critical thinking and independent research ability, your writing ability. So this personal statement is perhaps one of the most important piece, pieces of your application. I can't say enough about how important it is. And we would very much like for you to, um, to tell us why you're interested in the PhD program, what kind of research you might be interested in doing. Uh, just really quick reminder, at Columbia Urban Planning Program, we do not match a student with a potential advisor at time of admission. We actually encourage our students to come in and explore intellectually. So you also do not need to send us a research proposal. Oh, this is what I wanna do for my dissertation. It's too early your interests will change and very well will change dramatically once you enter uh, the program. Perhaps the direction will remain the same, but the specifics will for sure be changing. So we really wanted to see, you know, what kind of preparation and the capacity you have been building to allow you to pursue uh, that kind of research. And then of course, your experience with any uh, analytical reasoning, um, inclusive of quantitative and qualitative uh, spatial analysis methods, because this year we're not requiring GRE. And so if you have very strong background, it's totally fine. But if you feel a GRE could help you strengthen your application, you're welcome to take them. Um, so the review process is very much collective. The entire doctoral faculty, uh, all five of us will review them together. And then we will have some virtual discussion with finalists. Hopefully we'll make that happen early February. And we will uh, start informing top candidates uh, shortly after. But the admission or waitlist decisions will probably be issued somewhat later towards uh, March or so. And the deadline for decision is mid uh, April, April 15th. Okay, so that's the overall process and so on. And um, again, I would um, encourage you to connect, discover, and uh, really discover is really important. I, you know, if you, I can click this but later. Basically you go to our PhD webpage. From there, you'll be able to see past dissertations by our students, as well as alumni placement of the program. So you get a better sense of where our students are, have been, and so on. So let me stop right here. And then so we can open up for questions, discussions, and then let me first see if we have any questions in the chat box, we're all good. Okay, doke. So why don't I invite uh, my colleagues to introduce their work a little bit, and then we can, um, uh, 
uh, start the Q&A and a uh, fairly informal discussion. So feel free to jot down your questions now or just raise your hand later. Um, I'll be watching for um, those signals. So Heba. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to meet you. Um, I'm Hiba Boakar. I um, am a system professor of urban planning in the in the program, and um, I teach um, for for the PhD. I teach the planning history, uh, planning theory course, advanced planning theory course, and I teach also masters in uh, planning history and theory with, uh, that PhD students take in their first year before they take the advanced planning theory course. Uh, in terms of my, I also teach electives on. Uh, issues related to um, exclusion, uh, uh, citizen crisis, uh, which is related more to my research. I work on uh, urban planning as it, as it relates to citizen conflict, post-conflict cities, uh, issues related to segregation and um, uh, ex social exclusion. Uh, so my latest book uh, entitled For the War Yet to Come, Planning Beirut Peripheries, it talks about, it's an ethnographic, what we mean by ethnographic, it's a very much uh, um, um, you get in, you get like immersed a lot in your in the context. You do a lot of um, observations and participant observation as well as interviews and um, with with the local community over an extended period of time. So I I am from Beirut and that research is based in Beirut, and it basically was uh, it's about how religious political organizations shape, use urban planning tools like zoning, master planning, how they intervene in housing and real estate markets to shape spaces in. Um, cities after after war or what we call post conflict cities that are still uh, expecting um, future crisis to happen and we, we, it's not only about Beirut it also theorizes from Beirut about things that what what does urban planning mean when the future is uh, is like foreclosed like a climate when, what, what, how do you think urban plan and planning in a future uh, characterized by climate crisis or by pandemic or by war and refugee uh, displacement crisis and so how do you think of urban planning beyond the modern idea of uh, infinite progress and everything is going to be better how what what how does how does that sh that new ways of seeing the future shape uh, our field so this is what my research is on and i continue to work on um, along these axes and i'm happy to answer any questions you may have thank you hiba uh, tom Hi, everyone. Um, pleasure to meet you all. I think I've actually met a few of you already in individual calls, so nice to see you again. Um, I am um, Professor of Urban Planning here. Uh, I, I'm the new guy here, by the way. I only got here at the beginning of September, uh, so um, I'm new to the program. And I have to say that the students who I've met so far on the program are fantastic. And not only in terms of the intellectual energy, but the fact there's a very strong sense of community among them. And I've been really impressed uh, by how they look after each other and they debate with each other. And that's a really exciting thing to see. So um, I'm perhaps a bit unusual in the urban planning program in that I'm not trained as an urban planner. My background is in urban geography. Um, but I, I use all kinds of work in, in my own research, so um, urban planning is just one discipline that I engage with uh, when I do my work, and I think that's an important thing for, for us all to be as interdisciplinary as we can to learn about different approaches and different perspectives. Uh, so my work uh, has, over the past 20 years, uh, been on various aspects of urban inequality. Um, I suppose I'm best known for my work on gentrification and displacement. You know, my PhD over 20 years ago now was a comparative study of gentrification and displacement in New York and Toronto. Um, and I also have done various uh, work on uh, questions of urban marginality, territorial stigmatization, housing justice struggles, and also I engage uh, a lot with critical urban theory and try and move debates forward in my work. Uh, in terms of the regional focus, uh, the bulk of my work, my published work has been on uh, global north contexts. But more recently, I've become very interested in what's been going on in respect of urbanization in South Africa, specifically the, the city of Cape Town. Uh, when I was at the University of Edinburgh, where I worked for 14 years before Columbia, I took students to South Africa, and through those connections I made in order to do that, I've developed very strong research interests in some of the um, spatial planning issues which uh, particularly Cape Town is facing. Uh, my most recent book is called Shaking Up the City, 
And what this is, is um, it, it's, it's a book about urban inequalities in multiple contexts, how they emerge, how they are sustained, and what can be done to reduce them. And while I explore those issues, I also provide a critical analysis of the concepts, categories, and methods of what I call mainstream urban studies, where structural and institutional arrangements generating inequalities tend to go unquestioned and accepted. So what I try and do in that book is articulate an approach to urban studies that brings together epistemological critique with social critique in an effort to encourage the formulation of research-driven policies um, as a counterpoint to mainstream policy-driven approaches to urban research. So that's a bit about me. Um, I'm very excited to be here at Columbia and uh, all I'll, I'll just finish by saying apply. There's a lot of energy with this program and it's exciting to be part of it. Very nice to meet you all. Thank you, uh, Tom. And so let me introduce a little bit of the two other faculty members. I just typed in the chat box, which you, you will see. First, I wanna introduce uh, quickly is uh, Professor Hugo Samiento. So his areas of interest, uh, as you can see from the chat box, climate change adaptation, post-disaster recovery, spatial inequalities, political economy, and Latin American urban geography. So he's very much of a Latin American specialist as well. And you will see actually all of us have some uh, regional interests across the world and which really engages sort of our teaching and research in a way that goes well beyond planning, as Tom was saying, and so uh, is uh, Hiba's work and my own work. We are all quite a bit involved in the uh, area studies, kind of traditional Middle Eastern studies, you know, Chinese studies and so on. And then with our um, colleague, Hugo, um, or Latin America, he's worked quite a bit in Colombia, uh, as well as now in Puerto Rico. He also has work now in New York City, all from the lens of climate adaptation and uh, what we call um, uh, uh, retreat uh, and uh, uh, all of that. So uh, feel free to check out his work. And I had a question in the chat box saying, uh, should we contact a prospective professor uh, before your application? My, uh, yes, <laughs> my is shaking, right? Exactly, I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, some of you may not heard this um, or you dial in uh, after I said that, is that we do not do the matching at this point. Uh, and most likely you will be connecting with the professor during the end of your first year time, even going into second year as you begin to prepare for your comprehensive exam. Um, so, um, there, so just kind of be mindful of the time commitment that each of us has to our doctoral program and master's programs and teaching and so on. And so it's kind of challenging often for us to be able to give you really sustained as well as detailed feedback as you approach prior to your application. And then once uh, we have reviewed applications, we'll have this virtual discussion with the shortlisted um, applicants. At that point, I think it will be good time, say, to reach out or even we'll engage all of the faculty in those discussions and you have opportunity to do that. So I apologize if we're not able to for all of our faculty to be individually fielding questions uh, in advance, okay? Another faculty, uh, we are thrilled to have him joining us this year, uh, is um, Anthony Vanke. Uh, again, you can see in the chat box. Um, oh yeah, I didn't hit the <laughs> return keys. You didn't see Hugo just now. So now you see, right? You see Hugo and you see Anthony. So Anthony um, is our big data guy. Uh, of course, he also has a really strong training in design and um, architecture, so very much built environment anchored big data kinds of approach, very critical, very much looking at how communities engage in the kind of the analytical and uh, ground building process. So transportation and mobility, he's not your typical transportation kind of modeling person. He really looks at transportation from point of view of mobility and accessibility. 
and he's very much into urban form. And then the rule of urban information and technology, uh, of course, method, uh, methodologically, his approach is very much spatial analysis and uh, big data modeling. Uh, Hugo's work is primarily uh, qualitative in a methodological approach. So um, they are now, all five of us are advising students and to say just a little bit about myself, um, I'll copy this too, that I have worked primarily in the context of urbanization across the global south and how to bring into conversation with um, urban theories, especially as related to migration and how migrants navigate uh, the urban scene once they arrive in cities, right? And so I have geographically primarily focused on China and the East Asian context. And methodologically, I am a mixed methods kind of person. I've done very large scale surveys, very much demographic, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, demographic kind of research type of large survey. Um, but I also have done quite a bit in-depth interviews and firm interviews because another line of my research is really looking at how cities manage resources as well as uh, using land as a source of financing for infrastructure development. And so there involves quite a bit firm interviews. And so I do both large survey. I haven't done a lot in more recent years, but um, I use quite a bit survey data in my work as well. So I show the, the couple of books I've been uh, writing and really it's a look at uh, how the trajectories of post-socialist cities in terms of settlement forms, as well as um, settlement processes, especially for migrants, are in a way resembling as well as diverging from migrant settlement patterns, say in Latin America cities, or even to some extent, uh, African cities. So that's my work. So before I open up completely for other questions, I want to say, so Hiba teaches the advanced theory class required. Hugo teaches, will be teaching next semester the advanced history, planning history class. And Tom is teaching the colloquium on urban, critical urban theory. And Anthony will be teaching the colloquium on research design and quantitative methods. And I teach the uh, applied qualitative methods colloquium. So you see all five of us teach the core courses. You have quite a bit of interaction students uh, with each of us prior to students taking comprehensive exams. Okay, so we had a couple of questions. Let me just answer that so that we don't forget these questions. So if your master's program our uh, master's degree is from an English speaking university, say in UK or US, but you are originally from an international uh, origin, uh, you don't need to submit TOEFL because your university was you know, English in, in instruction. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to um, email our GSAP admissions. Um, uh, address. So Sarah, if you're there, can you just type in the GSAP admissions email address in the chat box uh, whenever you can. Um, also, for those of you from low resources countries, if you need to waive application fees, that is also the email to uh, send your inquiry to. We can't really help you, unfortunately. And then, uh, unfortunately, we do not have part-time option for PhD programs. The PhD program is really an intensive preparation process for an, an academic career primarily. And as a, re, as a result, uh, it's really, really, really challenging to do it part-time. It's not just in our university, I think across the board. Uh, at, you know, at the dissertation stage, some of our students go on and work, but in the first few years, generally that's 
very, very difficult. And we will be taping the session. We are taping the session. So those of you who need to leave early, feel free to do that. Okay, though, I think, thanks, Sarah. The emails, email is in the chat box. So let's open up completely to uh, your questions. You can address it directly to any of our faculties uh, or in general to all of us. Uh, yes, the hand raising option is enabled. You go to uh, reactions and go to raise hand. Or you can just holler. Okay, um, let's see if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Aya? Uh, it, yes, it's, uh, it's Aya. Aya, okay. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Um, sorry, that um, so my question was, um, you know, just taking into consideration, I think, just the climate around, you know, just racial justice, and particularly the conversation around, you know, uh, equity, particularly for the Black community. Um, I've been, you know, looking at your program and, and got a chance to connect with some of uh, your uh, faculty, current current students. Just kind of curious as to you all's perspective of those who are representing um, uh, the department today, you know, uh, just uh, what how you think um, uh, uh, this program is, is is currently doing and maybe what are some of the, the hopes for the program around supporting uh, candidates who specifically want to focus on Black issues and anti-racist kind of planning um, with that particular focus in the Black community? Um, and, and what are ways that students are currently able to engage utilizing um, the current capacity and perspectives that are available, but also being aware as a smaller program and, 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 and not uh, with particularly faculty who, who, are, who are, who come from that community, how's the institution kind of like working to support or the department working to support students who have that lens, that, that interest in their, in their research? Um, and is it like through collaboration with other departments or are there other internal kind of strategies or, or even uh, ex anecdotal experiences that students have uh, been able to experience that have allowed them to focus on that and in, in, in that area? I know newer faculty might not have as much of a perspective on that, but. Oh, I think they do because they actually work on some of the related issues. So in fact, I would invite my colleagues to chime in. Okay, um, let me just uh, explain a few things that I'm doing here. Um, so I teach a, a colloquium, as Wei Ping said, called Critical Urban Theory. And one of the things which I'm excited about with that, uh, with that colloquium is how uh, we are engaging with some of the real cutting edge debates in urban theory right now, much of which are to do uh, with for example, things like gentrification is not just about class, it's about racial capitalism. Another example, we're looking at theories of racial segregation, many of which uh, still today uh, are used uh, even to, to explain things, even though they were formulated 70, 80 years ago at a very different time. So we're looking at how relevant some of these uh, you know, for example, measures of racial segregation are when we're when we are use them uh, to apply to cities today. Okay, so we're having these kinds of conversations in in my theory class. Another thing I should tell you about is uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, I met a, a community organization um, based in Manhattanville, just north uh, of uh, Columbia University campus, and um, this is called the United Front Against Displacement. And it actually has several uh, outposts, this organization, not just in New York City, but I met the New York organizers. And this is actually really exciting for me because it's an opportunity to do things a little differently to um, how maybe they've been done in the past across the institution. So for example, Columbia uh, has a very ugly history of gentrification of Harlem, right? And I think it's important that we look at this history and bring in people into the university to talk to our students about what they're doing in order to, uh, to fight for affordable housing, fight against displacement. And so that's what I'm gonna be doing in my master's program teaching, but I'm certainly excited to see uh, doctoral students engage with these issues as well. Uh, so that's just a couple of examples of things that I'm doing, um, but there may be others from my colleagues as well. Thank you, Tom. That, that that does sound incredibly exciting. Do you would you like to share some of the work you've done? Uh, yeah. First, I mean, the students uh, when we uh, after the murder of George Floyd, uh, the students that we had here, we got together 
and we did a reading uh, list that the student driven reading list about racial reckoning with the field of urban planning and it's something we continue to have a conversation because we don't have a clear answer from the urban planning profession that had a big hand in in redlining and segregation and what we got like the the exclusion of the black communities here urban planning played a big role in doing that and so how to do a racial reckoning with the profession is a big question that i think uh, all of us are trying to um, to uh, think about and work and so tom has talked about a little bit about about that i, I during the the pandemic i worked on two projects given that we weren't able to travel one is about how the urban res planning response to the killing of Tra uh, Trevor Monton uh, in Florida and what does the role of urban planning how what was the urban planning response to the killing of of a black man in a in a in a privatized neighborhood but also what are the what were what was the urban planning response and how the response was not up to task in terms of continuing similar um, uh, patterns of of uh, exclusion but in, in using new terminologies so that was one paper that is um I submitted for review and it's um, it's been I uh, it's been ex, uh, re requested for revise and resubmit. So it's about it's about that is that the cyclical notion of urban planning that you they keep urban planning keep keep being called upon to uh, correct mistakes of the past only to fall again into traps of uh, what could what could we do and then reinforcing similar patterns of patterns of exclusion from before. And the second project is um, along what Tom was walking, uh, working on, uh, talking about is that during the pandemic, I I, I stayed here, and um, Colombia is very much the ho housing faculty is really next to public housing. We're, I mean, there is a history for Colombia and the creation of these public housing projects and the urban uh, urban renewal project that was that happened in the 50s, and so it was very clear at some point that the deaths or the ambulances were coming across the street way more often than they were coming to our part of the neighborhood. So I started a research program. A, pro, a project on what is the role, how did this split in the neighborhood between the, the si Columbia side that is like fancy buildings, fancy living, and just across Broadway, it's a destitution, continuous, continue, continual destitution since the urban renewal project. So I've also been working, and one of my students who was our master's students, and now she's doing a PhD, uh, um, now she moved to Berkeley, uh, is working with me on, the, on that project. So trying to bring uh, Colombia's history into accountability in, in, in what's happened in Harlem. Thank you. That, that's really important and really helpful to know. Uh, thank you. Great. And so let me also then answer a few questions. Uh, Heba already um, typed in some um, answers to straightforward questions, but there are some questions that are probably beneficial to all of you guys. So one question has to do with um, Besides stipend, what are other opportunities for grants, scholarships to support research, travel, equipment, and so on? So um, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, uh, for which we are kind of uh, a collaborator that regulate uh, G GSAS. So when you apply, you'll notice your application portal is actually GSAS instead of GSAP, right? GSAS is Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So the unionization, as well as the uh, sort of um, regularization of various different procedures um, happens primarily at the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. And so there, there are some uh, uh, wonderful opportunities, for instance, Fulbright and uh, other kinds of opportunities. There's a whole list of fellowship you can apply through campus. Um, so we generally encourage our students to think about that more geography and spatial sciences and planning related, such as the NSF dissertation improvement grants or um, social science research council or ACLS, American Council of Learned Society, those kinds of fellowships, primarily external. Internally, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences has began a travel stipend uh, process. And so our school GSAP uh, is following suit and that will allow uh, a student to apply for travel funding. I think, don't quote me on this, it's not being uh, publicized yet, uh, twice during your PhD career um, applying for funding. It's non-competitive as long as you have a conference invitation, uh, twice I believe for funding. And then, um, that's on the funding side. Uh, I have another question uh, about whether if you're interested in climate adaptation, 
whether UP or HP PG program is more relevant. I mean, I think the scale at which we do investigation in urban planning versus his, uh, historic preservation uh, are very different, right? Especially, I believe the historic preservation program at uh, Columbia has actually a quite refined scope uh, at the material level, at the even almost the building material level of how you know climate has affected you know the changing composition of building materials and so on and so forth. They have a lab. They do have one faculty, you know, I'm not fully familiar, but they do have one faculty who looks at more of, you know, large areas of um, uh, sort of heritage or cultural heritage preservation. But generally, I think the scale of investigation is very, very different. I don't think you can apply, which is safer and so on. It really has to do with your interest. Um, how does teaching factor in during the PhD process at Columbia? Are there opportunities to teach at GSUB and what are the common classes that PhD students are involved with? So um, I mentioned that year two to four are uh, the time uh, when a PhD students either are appointed as a research fellow or teaching fellow, most likely are teaching fellows. So Heba knows, for instance, in her master's uh, required course on uh, planning history and theory. She has three doctoral students as TAs. So the TA opportunities are primarily required um, master's degree courses, planning theory and history, planning methods, planning law, and economics for planners at this point, as well as studios. That's for a smaller number of doctoral students, but some of our doctoral students are very interested in connecting with practice, but also you know, in many planning programs across the North America, there are significant studio components of teaching. So generally PhD students do not independently teach during their years two to four, but during their year um, six and seven, if you don't complete, there might be opportunities Right now, one student has been involved in our undergraduate summer class uh, teaching, which was really tremendous for the student as introduction to planning for undergraduate students exploring about the field. We do have students who uh, go out to other institutions in New York City and do adjunct teaching in that advanced years. So we generally try to encourage students not to start doing that so that they can focus on their research, but in their fifth year or sixth year, um, they can do that. Okay, if you have graduate from our master's degree several years ago, work in the industry, can we ask for professional references? Yes, of course, um, but you must have recommendations that speak to your academic preparation and abilities for independent research. Um, so again, for references, do we prefer all of them come from the most recent academic sources? Uh, that really depends. So again, um, who writes your letters um, really depends on how well they know you, how much they can speak to your abilities, your experience, your qualifications. You know, sometimes we know the big name professor, but they write one paragraph, right? So like doesn't tell us anything. And you want the letter to be really substantive, to be really speaking to your strength as well as opportunities for you to grow. And so I can't give you a yes or no to this question, but I would encourage you uh, to find people who know you well, who can write really substantive letters. I think I've answered all of the questions in the box, right? Am I missing anything? So let's open up more to the floor if you have other questions. Uh, if there's no questions right now, I, I want to take this opportunity to talk briefly about, about um, the um, statement uh, of purpose. Um, already Wei Ping mentioned that it's a very important element of your application, but of course, I think many of you probably that's the first time applying for a PhD program, so 
it's not like a master's application kind of statement. So it's not like where you grew up or what you did so far of interest. It really has to, you need to stand, you want to stand out and it has to show ability to ask important recent questions to be able to, to show that you know where you're heading, where where is the state of the research in the, like for example, if you're interested in climate adaptation, uh, and urban planning, what is the state of the field at the current moment and why is what what kind of interest of questions you're interested in. So it's not just like what you did. It's not like a repetition of your CV, basically, but work make put work into clarif clarifying why you are interested in these kind of questions, where where do you find yourself, what what is um, inspiring these questions and where why Colombia is uh, is is relevant to answering these kind of questions you're interested in in researching. So I feel like this is an important thing to keep in mind is that the statement of purpose is a very important element of your application, but it's also, it's not like the master's one. It's a bit more developed in terms of uh, research and showing critical thinking and uh, interest in, in writing and reflecting on the subjects you're interested in. Yeah, thank you, Hiba. And I'm, let me also add a little bit because we over, over the time that we've seen various different personal statements and don't be too worried about the you know word limit, right? If anything, longer is probably better. Of course, I'm not talking about 10 pages. <laughs> I'm talking about three or four pages at max. <laughs> but you should really tell, so some of you will say, oh, I did this and that in my master's program. I wrote this thesis. But what about the thesis? What questions did you ask in the thesis? Why is it an important question for us to care, right? What did you find? what might even be the limitation of that work, right? Um, and that's why you're going on for PhD program, right? If you were so, so happy and the thesis did all of what you wanted to do, you probably didn't want to do a doctoral program. I mean, so we really are looking at um, um, that kind of depth of thinking and even curiosity, right? In a way of, based on your thesis research, for instance, and you become curious at you know, how things might work, uh, were one of the conditions be different and so on and so forth. So you have no answer, right? You're exploring, but you have been reading uh, about other uh, relevant literature. Any sample needs to be well thought of. It doesn't need to be long. It could be a short five or six uh, page paper for your, let's say a term paper for your master's elective, but there you've really asked uh, a good question and showcase your ability to go and uh, dig out evidence or dig out theoretical uh, sort of uh, arguments among different scholars around that topic. So again, think about your application having a narrative, narrative that says, you are interested in this kind of work or this direction of research. You've been thinking about these kinds of questions and the kind of methodological approach you might be taken or may be interested in taking uh, is this and that. And, you know, it's very much of a little bit, you know, conjecture in a way in what you want to do and how what you have done prepares you to do that. Okay, so we do have a question. Looking into several PhD programs, my perception is that intellectual rigor is a key driver to be applied on current and upcoming theme. How is it an event of technology paradigm changes impacting the doctoral research environment at Columbia? It's a good question. <laughs> um, I think, uh, so again, of course, we'd love to have all of you here, but uh, the match between your interests and what we have to offer is also important, right? Uh, even though we do not match uh, a perspective or you know, incoming student with the advisor, we are very mindful whether or not we can actually support a student with their interest. So this research environment and expertise um, are indeed an important question. So someone wants to come in and do uh, advanced modeling, either in environmental science, transportation studies, we're not it. 
don't come, don't even apply, don't bother. We can't support you. We don't have the infrastructure, meaning we don't have large funded grant projects to allow you to say do massive um, kinds of data analysis and modeling. We have a new colleague, Anthony, who works on big data. His approach is very much grounded kind of approach. He doesn't really go out there, say, do large scale travel diaries. He doesn't do that, right? He's more critical by using already available data sources. And so, yes, indeed, the, the uh, technological change have affected our research environment. In general, though, we are in a architecture school and we are very much based on a social science approach. So those of you who are interested more of engineering and science kinds of approach, we probably are not a good place for you. Our, yeah, our Maybe program has just, oh, yeah. Sorry, Go ahead. Go for it, Hippa. No, no, you, you, you. I saw okay. um, I'll just add something to that. Like, um, uh, I, I'm as far away from the big data thing as you could imagine. I, what, what I tend to say about myself is I tend to ask big questions of small data. Um, so I, I tend not to um, know very much about large data sets and that kind of thing. And I certainly don't know very much uh, about the sort of technological side of things when you mentioned the technological paradigm changes. Um, just to give you an example of that, I usually have to get students to help me just set up anything. Uh, so I really am not very <laughs> tech. Uh, so, and I'm here, and uh, that is, I hope, an indication of, uh, of how much um, that impacts the doctoral research environment in terms of technological paradigm changes. So uh, it's a really good question you asked, but um, yeah, to, to, uh, small data is fine too, is what I'm trying to say. I think you want to say something. Yeah, I, I was just uh, I, I was just going to clarify, like just to, to speak to both what you both said is that we have been centering and working a lot on social justice, racial justice as our centered, but uh, the Columbia campus is an extension of our program. So our program is small, but if you want to like do more uh, oral history, if you want to do uh, ethnography, if you want to do data, there are all these other departments that the students go to. So we provide the core courses that you everyone has to go and uh, has to do, and they are at the center, the centerpiece of creating our community. And as uh, Weiping and Tom said we have a very strong community of PhD students. I it's a small program and therefore people connect with each other. They do peer uh, peer support for each other, which I found. I I came from a large PhD program, so I'm finding this very fascinating, like very uh, uh, tightly knit PhD program and very interesting. People really are helping each other, supporting each other, and it's much more rewarding intellectually. But also people go out to the history department, to the sociology department, to the anthropology department. So uh, to to learn new methods, to learn uh, about subjects about ethnic, uh, uh, for example, where ethnic studies is, where African-American studies is. So there are all these other departments that people take courses with to support what they're going to study. So we provide the core, but then also you need to do your own work. And there are all these students to help you figure out what courses to take across campus to support the research and math research question and methods that you're interested in pursuing. Yeah, let me just add really quickly to that. Also, um... It doesn't actually mean that you have interest in big data, this is not the place. Actually, in fact, we want to inject a more critical lens into the use of big data. So we had this you know, search and a big soul searching about the data and big data urban analytics in planning. And what happened then, we felt that a lot of people nowadays who use data you know, out in the various different uh, practices or um, research tends to ask, you know, sort of smaller questions. So we want to really rise up for PhD education and students to occupy an important position in the evolution of urban analytics within urban planning and also beyond urban planning. For instance, you know, the smart cities discourse now very much is dominated by data scientists and engineers and really lacks the um, sophistication and the questioning of positionality of you know, that planning students and faculty have. So we are very interested in students who can come in and really critically assess the, uh, uh, the use of uh, 
uh, technology in planning. And so, uh, as Hiba was saying, that on campus we have a very strong data science institute, which also has a very strong component on smart cities. And so we very much want our students and faculty to be part of that, that dialogue. Um, before I, people who, who have raised their hand digitally. Yeah, so yeah, I, we, before I come to you, Ryan, I did have a question in the box. Um, I'm not sure, Lindsay, I get what you're saying. Uh, how do you approach this internally in terms of equity in the faculty and with your student body? Uh, can you just specify what you're saying there? You're saying our research clearly uh, centers around subjects of equity, but how do you approach this internally? Do you want to specify that? All right, I'm not sure Lindsay is still here. Anyway, moving on to Ryan. Yes, hi. Um, I'm a bit curious about how the program, um, I mean, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Bakar and Professor Slater mentioned their work on the community around like the research on the ambulances sort of uh, that you had mentioned on the when you notice the frequency of the ambulances on one side or the other. Um, I'm curious if there is opportunity for students to sort of interact with the community that Columbia occupies um, in general while they're there. And if those opportunities are ones that, they, that you've seen students have to look for, or do they typically come up just organically? Yeah, that's. Um, so like Tom is saying, I'm also, uh, me too. I mean, after the, so historically, yes, the faculty has were involved in the planning. More recently, we're trying to we're trying to build bridges with people who are resistant gentrification or resisting. Um, there's a, this whole new campus for Columbia in, in in West Harlem that they're like trying to to stop building towers or trying to modify the master planning and stuff. So also, I'm connecting with certain people from the neighborhood who are who are working um, working towards that. So this is from the but but for a PhD. So in masters, we're trying to do and Weiping can talk more about like the studios that people are doing this more uh, about uh, uh, with being sensitive to the community but also on the PhD is basically about building your own research question and your own um, uh, your own uh, connections but also if we have connections we're happily like everyone can benefit from everyone's connections in the neighborhood but um, but I don't know masters it's more it's been more through design studios or something maybe Wei Ping can clarify on that um, the Harlem, Harlem component uh, you no, know, actually, uh, that we only did one uh, studio with Harlem. Um, the challenge there is also, you know, the tortured history between Columbia and Harlem. And we don't, our really, our thinking is we don't really want to be further uh, kind of um, continuing that um, relationship. So we've been quite, um, I guess, in a way, careful about that. And we only do that with faculty who have deep understanding or faculty who actually come from uh, uh, Harlem uh, in terms of adjunct faculty. So we had a practicum last year with uh, a historian of East Harlem who uh, came in and led a small group of master student project. Uh, and then, so it's been um, kind of tentative in a way, if I say it, because our students are also very mindful of uh, of that kind of relationship that Columbia has had. So in, uh, there's a question in the chat box in terms of infrastructure, do PhD students have a designated area within the school? Yes, they have a PhD room where they uh, convene all the time and it's a very, they made it really comfortable and nice. And this is where they host. We have a um, PhD, first year, uh, second year PhD students organize our lecture series uh, that we host every Tuesday at noon. Uh, with lunch and uh, people, uh, they invite uh, the scholars they're interested or practitioners inter they're interested in hearing and master students attend. And then most of the time the PhD students um, invite the scholar or invite uh, the guests to the PhD room where they can have lunch with, with them and ask questions more, um, more personal, uh, more one-on-one -on -one questions with, with, with our guests. So there is a space for the PhD students and they work and do workshops there. We, sometimes we do workshops with them in that room. Um, also, there's a 
question about what are the subfields of urban planning studied research in GSAP. There isn't like a specific, uh, there's, so we're not in the, we're not, uh, our program does not like bring in students who are just aligned with our research interests. So we don't have like research groups. We're not interested in just uh, expanding our research agenda. So people work on all sorts of things and we are here to advise them collectively and some work with advisor, but we don't admit students just because we want to like produce more and publish more there. Everyone is doing all sorts of different, different things and we're here to support them. We don't have the kind of a, uh, a group uh, mentality here so you're welcome to apply on uh, apply uh, um, based on interest in any kind of subject and if we feel uh, we can support you and you rise to the top we're happy to 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 admit you yeah i also basically copied the link to the uh, page of our doctoral dissertation in the past 10 or 15 years you get a sense of what our students have been working on it's quite a broad range of topics um, i think there's someone uh aya you have another question oh okay sorry i meant to lower my hand from before okay Do you have other questions on the applications, on the program, things you're wondering about, you're curious about, about for uh, questions for individual faculty? Yeah, so um, we do have a question. So maybe, Hiba, you can get started on that question. You mentioned that the program seeks to make connections between the global north and global south. Can you provide some examples of these connections? <laughs> I mean, our existence is an example. <laughs> so all, <laughs> all of us in the program, as uh, faculty in the program, work. And I, I, my research is uh, is in the Middle East, but I also teach in the Global North. But also now I'm bringing back thinking from the Global South to thinking about the geographies of Colombia and Harlem here and Sanford, Florida, for example, and thinking between the Global North and the Global South. We actually also our program does not only teach theories that are emerging from the global north, but because this has been the history of urban planning, but we're very much what we call decolonizing or post-colonizing our curriculum by always thinking, in every, at least in my courses, for example, every session uh, brings together readings from the global north and the global south to think together, to think collectively with the students around across these geographies. So it's a pedagogical quest. It's also a research quest. Um, and uh, all of us are working in this kind of, uh, between these two geographies, theor I theorize, Basically, I'm very much invested in um, provincializing planning theory and urban theory by uh, by thinking from the global south on questions not only related to the global south but also to the global north. And the global south and global north, it's important the way we think about them are not only geographies. It's not like oh, this is uh, just another way of saying developing countries or quote unquote what used to be said third world countries, but also to recognize that they're third uh, like there's a global south in the global north so when we think about inner cities the way they've been treated or uh, it's it's a way in, uh, the dispossession that happened but also that there are geographies of global north in the global south themselves when we talk about uh, the one percent the one the one percent in certain countries and the geographies of of inequality and wealth uh, in certain geographies so it's also a theoretical lens not only a just a geography mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, let me also add that uh, Hiba is absolutely right. I think this connection is in our research, in our teaching, but also just say materially, we also do quite a bit uh, conferencing forum that connect scholars across, you know, the broadly different parts of the world. Uh, you know, Hiba is doing, I think, planning a conference on uh, Middle Eastern urbanism. Yeah. And then over last weekend, uh, every fall, we also have a forum called Urban China Forum. It's actually organized by mostly master's students, but we bring scholars from China and scholars who work on China who are here or in Europe into conversations about uh, common shared interests. Um, in fact, one of my uh, recent books uh, really is based on the contributions of authors from various different world regions on the impacts and transitions in China's urbanization uh, on the forum we held in 2019, just before pandemic. So finally, that volume is coming out um, last month. Um, so yes, you know, materially, 
uh, we are really trying on that as well. Okay. Let me also add, um, I mentioned my interest in South Africa. Um, the last few years, I've been having some fascinating conversations with two uh, community-based organizations, one of them called Reclaim the City, the other one called Endifuni Ukwazi. And these are organizations which respond to the ongoing problem of land dispossession, uh, which is probably one of the big issues facing everybody in South Africa, uh, not just historically, but these days as well. And they respond by foregrounding black and indigenous knowledges and how uh, indigenous understandings of land, indigenous ontologies uh, are really important in terms of reorienting spatial planning, um, which has a, a very, very ugly history in South Africa. And so what I've been trying to do um, is learn from these organizations and see how I can bring that into my teaching first and foremost. So the critical urban theory course, uh, I'm using some recent work on bringing decolonial theory uh, into urban studies and thinking about what I've learned from these organizations. And so that's how I bring in my own uh, experiences and the experiences of these organizations into a global North classroom. So that's uh, uh, how I'm doing things at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tom. I think we have a question from Kayla. Yes, hi. Um, thank you so much so far for just a really great session this morning. Um, and I, I just wanted to briefly ask, so Professor Slater mentioned earlier in his opening remarks about um, there being a really great community among um, the PhD students and also great debate among them. And I'm curious, uh, you know, if beyond just kind of classes, what opportunities exist for really healthy debate, um, theoretical debate, um, or just conversations that allow uh, for students and faculty uh, to come together and uh, I think really get more into the material of you know what perhaps is just not within um, you know our required courses, um, but really push more uh, conversations uh, around theory or uh, what what we would want to kind of continue to dig into. So, and that I think rank could, you know, be opportunities for either um, inviting uh, lecturers to come to campus or, or even just like if there are, um, you know, just open, yeah, I guess like meeting some, some way. Yeah, I, I'm curious if there are those opportunities for those conversations. Tom, do you wanna, oh, I Yeah, do. so um, yeah. I just mentioned the experience of one of my students a few weeks ago. Uh, she presented her work, uh, which she's doing in India to a, a group of us um, who met during lunchtime. And um, Wei Ping, what, what was the name of this, um, what's the name of this forum where this happens? The one that Jen is organizing. Right, so it's the PhD research workshop. That's it. Okay, so they, uh, a PhD led workshop where people get a chance to bring along their latest ideas and to get feedback. And what was really nice about this is how um, this student um, was at a point where they were sort of struggling to put some things together, presented the problem, and then the feedback from about, what, 15, 20 people was tremendous, and they were really buzzing after it. So, um, and actually there were people in there who were from beyond the program. Uh, so it was actually really nice to see that kind of supportive environment. Um, and also, as Hiba mentioned earlier, the students do invite external speakers um, and uh, host those speakers and have discussions with them that go beyond simply the presentation that that speaker gives. There are probably other things that Wei Ping and Hiba will um, mention as well. Yeah, so <laughs> Columbia is such a sort of uh, wonderfully busy campus. There are so many opportunities. Sometimes it's actually too much. You know, our faculty would know we don't try to go to everything. If we do, we won't have time for anything <laughs> that we do on our own. So we actually, I mean, PG program is very different from a master's program. We encourage our students to take ownership of their learning. And this is actually also a period of time that uh, you're preparing for an independent research career. And so the independent part is actually quite important. Uh, we 
do have a mentoring system in a way that the doctoral faculty um, assess the progress of each doctor student at, at the end of the each year and then we provide feedback. So we also support in that formal way. But we but we really try to encourage students say if you are weaker in qualitative research methods, go take a class you know, in, in anthropology or sociology, but also to get to know faculty in those places through these classes. So our students have been doing quite a bit actually uh, getting the support without us knowing, you know, so these are some of the more organized formal mechanisms within the program, but our students are really um, encouraged to uh, uh, sort of take initiatives and to seek out assistance and support um, on their own. So one of our students has been working very closely with someone from public health, right? Because she also has a public health background. And it's really important doctoral program is, I guess, you know, if I say it probably less politely, is it's not a handheld process of learning. Um, and we really encourage more collaboration and more uh, sort of pushing the boundaries on our student side, yeah. Yep. Also, just to lighten things up, we're also a fun program. We actually like do potlucks with our students. We do picnics with our students. And so there's always a picnic at the beginning of each semester. We also sometimes do potlucks too. So it's not, it's also compared to other, other places, we are quite accessible and fun as a program. And because we, we are very, very tightly knit as a group. Um, and you can ask students about that, but yes, we are very, we, we, we do these things that are also not just about serious uh, stuff, but we get to know each other on a personal level as well. All right, Ines, you have your hand up. Hi everyone, thank you so much for the presentation. I just had a question. It's slightly overlapping with uh, a few previous questions, so I'm trying to aim right here. Uh, I'm we can just hear you, we can't hear you. we can't hear you that, pro can you speak in the mic proper? Oh, you can't hear me. I'll remove that then. No, we can't hear you, but we can't understand. But yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, better now. Okay. Um, so, yes, I don't want to overlap too much with previous questions. Uh, here it's mostly about the support for the research after the first uh, slash second year, once we are assigned a sort of... Um, I'm just wondering, like, do we have, like, a supervisor that we meet every week? Or is it a bit more free where you know, we can set it up with um, the group we're assigned with. Or, and also is it that we are sitting within a lab uh, with just a sort of group or is it more open for all the PhDs um, mingling and... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I completely get your question, but um, with the, the quality of the sound. Um, but I think I get it. So. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, that we are quite different from, say, uh, some large planning programs or engineering uh, science kind of approach. We don't have labs where PhD students sit around and you know um, uh, constantly working on similar topics. We are probably more like, if anything, social sciences and humanities. So. Uh, just about every doctor student works on somewhat different topic. They do collaborate. In fact, we have two doctoral students who just wrote an article together and got accepted at Journal of Urban Affairs. Um, we have these workshops for professional development, but generally the topics are quite esoteric, let's say, let's say it that way. And so students come together really to support each other and with faculty on the general approaches. But there is no such a thing that like you must work on your advisor's research, right? Kind of in science and engineering, that's kind of the approach. You know, there's a large research platform and, you know, everybody work around similar topics or parts of different processes or phases of that research. In, in us, students are very independent. So you as a student would be looking for who you want as your advisor starting from your proposal stage. Well, actually starting from your comprehensive exam stage, you already kind of are interacting with one or two faculty more closely. And then you 
would uh, ask one of them to be the chair, uh, sorry, your sponsor, we call it sponsor, essentially advisor for your dissertation. And then you work with your advisor to think about the makeup of your uh, doctoral um, dissertation proposal, as well as the actual doctoral dissertation committee. There's two separate committees, actually. We're thinking about streamlining that. Um, but um, at right now, you can have two diff completely different committees, except your advisor probably should stay the same. And then so who you want to be on that committee is really up to you and the advisor to work it out. We give you a complete autonomy and discretion in making that decision, especially who you want to invite as your external member, meaning uh, someone outside of GSAP and then someone even outside of Columbia. So you have a scholar who you really want to work with, say, uh, I don't know, um, at New School. Um, yes, bring them on board as part of your committee. Um, so it's, uh, I think the approach is quite similar to say sociology, uh, anthropology, uh, or even other humanities fields. Did that answer your question? You exactly answered my question, thank you. <laughs> All right, does the PhD program require campus residency for the entirety of the program? Um, so it's not framed as a residency, but all our classes in the first two years are in person, so you must be here. And then uh, second year through fourth year, you are you have responsibilities either as um, teaching or research fellows. So you need to be here. Although we have been quite flexible, especially when students need to go out and do field work and travel in their fourth year, and then they can kind of fulfill their. Uh, RAOT responsibility in their fifth year. And so I think most of our students during their four, uh, fifth year are not around as much. Uh, we do not kind of require them to be around uh, on the fifth, in the fifth year, yeah. No, it's not important to communicate with a potential advisor as we've indicated. Um, I think that, yeah, I would like to expand on this because we get a lot of requests and it's very hard to answer uh, all of you. So that's why we do this forum. And I, I think the conversation is probably more after you apply and you get admitted, we can have further conversations. But for now, I think just focusing on your statement of purpose, trying to see if this is a good fit. <laughs> also, also I, it probably goes without saying, but it's important to consider why you're doing a PhD because that's not a small commitment. You're committing five, six years of your life. And uh, even when you think about it, we still have students come to our offices. They're like, uh, well, I'm not sure why I'm here. What am I doing, et cetera. And then you like, like, like uh, what they uh, cry, uh, Existential crises are common in, in, in a PhD, so I'm not saying that you're not going to have one, but also to really think why you're going to want to commit five, six years of your life to this is important before you get in and realize what you did. Yeah, precisely. Uh, Tom, maybe you can answer the next question. It's, uh, it's about, thanks for mentioning the importance of indigenous knowledge in academia. Uh, la, la, la. I'm wondering if there are students looking at such topics within the program, if there are institutes or other scholars at Columbia with opportunities to expand on indigenous knowledge and indigenous ecology studies. Within the program, um, I'm not sure it is the answer because again, I'm very new here, um, but I don't think specifically indigenous knowledge is. However, there are people, of course, working with post-colonial theory, decolonial theory, settler colonial perspectives. So um, there are those theoretical interests which are there. Um, in terms of other schools at Columbia, I believe so. In fact, just last week, I believe there was an Indigenous Rights Day that was held at Columbia with all kinds of fascinating events, uh, which was showing the kind of research which is taking place. Um, unfortunately, I didn't go because I had COVID, uh, but uh, I, I'm aware that there were some interesting things happening on campus and it wasn't the first time. But yeah. difficult for me to answer these questions given that I've only been here seven weeks. Yeah, actually, so in the master's program, we will have a travel studio next spring uh, to Canada for working with a number of indigenous communities on um, some uh, community development projects. 
Uh, this is led by, this will be lead, led by a faculty who's originally from Canada, who's had long-term uh, connections with these communities throughout her career. Uh, so in the PhD program, I think, as Tom said, um, the actual kind of focus in working on that uh, is yet to come. But just to clarify that planning as a field also is recently like really deal like our settler colonialism is uh, some people work on that. And for example, aboriginals among aboriginals in Canada, et cetera. But in terms of thinking about that question here, it's it's sadly it's recent uh, in many ways. So also it's not like we are not teaching it, but we're including it in our syllabi. But it's it's basically now it's it's a front line of research in some ways. Yeah. We did invite someone from University of Toronto uh, yesterday. I don't know if any of you were able to dial in to Michelle's talk on uh, indigenous water relations. So um, I think there's a lot of interest among our students to uh, doctoral students because they organize these, um, they identify the speakers. So the fact that they were able to invite someone to speak uh, about this topic really reflects their interest uh, on the student side. All right, I think we're about time as well. And uh, again, um, this has been a fascinating kind of range of questions uh, and then allowing us to kind of provide more um, kind of uh, description of how we approach doctoral education, how the program is organized and how best you can uh, spend five years here if you get in. Uh, in terms of your own uh, growth. So best of luck um, with your next step. Um, you know, planning is a small field. <laughs> I, I, you know, for those of you who uh, continue to push the uh, boundaries and who get in wherever, whichever planning PhD program uh, will probably see you somewhere down the road in you know, our association conferences and so on. So stay in touch, even if let's say you uh, might not be studying at Columbia, you might be studying somewhere else, we'll be you know, uh, interested in keeping in touch and watching how you grow and, uh, and reading your scholarship down the road. So uh, best of luck and uh, we'll look forward to reading uh, your applications. Bye now.